Stop sharing there. Okay, she's all done. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our session on descriptive statistics in SVSS. Um, I'm Emma Ballard. I'm one of the senior statisticians at Kiyomar Berhofer, um, and our role is to service Metro North researchers in both consulting and collaborative work. So um, SVSS is, is available to all of you through um, on the Metro North computers. Um, so it's a nice, easy system to use. Uh, you can keep it very simple, um, just using drop-down menus, or you can use code. Today, we're just going to run through using the drop-down menus. So today's session, we're going to have a look at um, our data set in Excel and then how to bring it into SPSS. We're going to look at our categorical data and we're going to run frequencies. We'll look at continuous data, have a look at its distribution and how I would decide on whether to report mean or median values. We're going to have a look at um, how we pick our statistical tests and then we're going to analyse our data. So, and then importantly, um, the output that you get from these programs is lots of numbers. So what, what numbers do I actually want to extract from this output to present? And we'll put them together into a table and do an interpretation. OK, so descriptive statistics are used to summarise our data. So we usually do this in tables or we can do them in figures. Um, and it also helps us to highlight potential relationships between our variables. So descriptive statistics are usually measures of central tendency like mean, or there could be dispersion like a standard deviation and of course association. So today we're going to use uh, data that's available from this published RCT to learn about descriptive statistics. So it's a two group trial and we're comparing the analgesic efficacy of intranasal subventanol and intravenous morphine in acute trauma patients. So the content of this paper isn't really of interest to us. It's really the process that I'd really like to show you on how to run descriptive statistics. So these are essential components to any quantitative study. Um, and in fact, the steps that we're going to follow, you would have to apply for no matter what research um, study you're doing, no matter how statistically complex. So all research projects have a research question. So this is part of your protocol uh, that you've written and um, put submitted to ethics. So for this presentation, we're going to answer the following research question. So we're going to assess analgesia provided by fentanyl compared to morphine um, in acute trauma patients uh, using a numeric rating scale or NRS. So um, our most of you will be familiar with research questions. We have this PICO um, acronym that we use to make sure we have the right research questions. So our population of interest here is acute trauma patients. Our treatment is fentanyl. Our control or reference treatment is morphine. And our primary outcome is defined as a change in pain on the NRS between first administration and 30 minutes later. So when we design a study, it's always nice to have a think about where we're going to end up. So this kind of helps us to stay on track because we often get lost and excited when we're doing our research. Um, and so it's really good to think about, well, how am I going to interpret my um, primary outcome first? So for this study, it might be the mean difference between NRS at first administration and NRS at 30 minutes was A. Um, for morphine group and D for the sefentanil group, a mean difference between groups of this. So this is where we're going to end up at the end and we're just going to be finding the numbers through our data to fill out this sentence. So while we're at it, 
we might have a go at visualising the tables that we're going to be putting together. So again, this just keeps us on track for, and we're just going to be putting numbers into these tables. So um, on the first, the first table we have is a patient's characteristics table. So a patient characteristics table is the first table you're going to see in the vast majority of papers that you're reading. So this, the purpose of this table is for you, for other people to make, to be able to look at your patient population and to make inferences to their own patient population. So, um, that, so we have variables that we would commonly see in papers written by our peers and we f decide that these variables would be really important for our study too. So we have our patient de demographics to describe who they are and these variables, they can be in like in diff like described in many different ways. For instance, age you might report as a mean or you might prefer to report it as a percentage within an age range. And it all depends on firstly how you want to interpret your data and next on how other people in your field are reporting their data. So um, with an RCT we don't report p-values for a um, in our patient characteristics table. And this is purely because we have randomized our patients to the groups and so and therefore any differences that are occurring are purely by chance alone. So despite the fact that we don't report them, it doesn't mean that we don't actually test them. We always wanna have an idea and have a good feel for our data. So we're going to produce the p-values, but we wouldn't actually report them. So um, we don't have many variables in our data set. Um, today we're just going to do age, sex, heart rate, respiratory rate and co-analgesia used during the procedure. Our outcome variables um, are going, we're looking at some adverse events and then we have our change in NRS. Um, and so beside, at the tops of the columns, we have written some potential statistics that I might like to report. So it could be median and standard deviation or it could be reporting median interquartile range. When I say interquartile range, I mean the 25th and the 75th percentile. Um, so I think from all, you know, any of us who did statistics in undergrad, we were told that uh, interquartile range was a single number and it is, but not when you're affording it as a statistic like this. Um, so, and for our categorical variables, we're going to be reporting them as frequency and percentage. So these are standard um, and it doesn't get any more challenging than this. Um, for our variables. So um, for the outcome variables, the, most of them are frequency and percentage, and then we have a change in NRS. And so this is um, a continuous variable. So maybe we might report it as a mean or standard deviation. We don't know at this point. Okay, one of the other things here for our outcome variables is for hypertension, I've got a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 milligrams of mercury. So I'm only reporting, it's a binary categorical variable. So there's two categories. I only actually need to report one because I can look at that and see if I had, you know, 20% of people with hypertension, then I know that 80% of people didn't have it. So I know that information. I don't need to keep, like, I don't need to present both versions of the categories for you. So um, we just try to keep our tables nice and simple. Okay. So let's have a look at our Excel file. So I have downloaded the file from that paper. There's data and protocols uh, associated with that paper. Um, I've also at the end of this presentation, I've written code, like written the, so you can follow through what menus you have to click. I won't show them, but when you have a look, if you want to get a copy of the presentation, all those instructions are there. I will put them up if you want to take pictures of them or something. Um, and also how to extract the data. So it's a CSV file. Um, okay, so here is our data set. Um, the, the abbreviated data set that I'm going to present for this talk. So as we can see, our top row in our Excel file is our variable names. So we have ID, PP, group, sex, coanalgesia, et cetera, across. So uh, what you can see about those is that they're very short names 
And you can see that, for instance, over um, name anal co-analgesic, I've got an underscore, and then I've got a couple of other underscores on them. So this is because this software that we would like to use needs abbreviated, like really short names, and we can't have any spaces. So we use this underscore variable, um, underscore character instead of the space. So each of our variables is in a column in this data set, and our rows are our patients. So everything that there is to know about patient number one is in the second row in this data set. So um, you can also see that if you look really carefully, there is some empty cells. So in this data set, empty equals missing. So some people like to code missing, so they might code it 999. And so this tells the statistician or themselves, this is missing data, I know about it, it's not that I accidentally forgot to enter the data. So it's a way for us all to know that I know about it, I know why it's missing. Okay, so with every data set, we have a data dictionary. So this is to tell me what all these values mean because I don't know what they mean. There's lots of numbers here, there's some letters, there's some words, there's not to, I don't know what all the numbers mean. So we have a data dictionary, and this is what the one looks like for this data set. So column A is the variable. So I've literally just copied the top of my data set and I've transposed it, and that's the variables that we've got here. So in the next column is the detail. So this is what on earth do these little short words mean? So, um, you know, so we have, uh, for example, NRS underscore T0, that's the numeric pain rating scale at admission. So this, the, the details are important to tell us what we've got. And then we have our third column, which is our codes. So this is a, um, so it tells us what our, numeric variables are coded for. Sometimes it gives us our ranges of data, so what to expect, and it also can give details of missing data. So um, this is really useful, um, and it sh it's like an essential component with all of data sets that you're going to be producing. So as you can see here, um, our group variable, so I have it's been coded one for intravenous morphine and two for intranasal sufentanil. So the reason why we're coding categorical variables is because all of us make typos. We, it's just, it just happens. Um, so we want to minimise that and we want a clean data set that we don't have to make any adjustments to. So for instance, say um, sex, we have a small f, a capital F, a small word, a female, woman, but they're all different things and the statistical program doesn't know that they're all the same. And so we have to do a lot of work to fix those mistakes if we're not going to use numeric, um, especially if we've got a very large data set. So in order to minimise that, we recode them with numeric values. Okay, so in this data set, we also have a change in NRS. So I've actually calculated this in the Excel file for us. So it, all it is is the uh, T30 NRS minus the T0. So this one wasn't in the data set, I created it. And you can create variables in, in Excel or you can create them in SPSS. So um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. If you're really comfortable with Excel, I do a lot of work in Excel to prepare my data. Um, I, do, I do a lot of screening, a lot of like organising things around. So if that's what works for you, go for it. It's, it's more than fine to not do the, um, a lot of changing and modifying of your data set in SPSS. Okay, so let's bring it into SPSS. Okay, so here is SPSS. We're going to go to File, Open, Data. We're going to choose our Excel file. So we select Excel.
Okay, so it says that the variable names are in this first row, which they are. So, and we have a worksheet being SPSS. So I had lots of tabs on my Excel file and they're all here. <laughs> so you need to tell, like you need to pick the right one. So I call it SPSS data set. So I know exactly what the data set is and we hit okay. Okay, so here we go. So this is what SPSS looks like. Let me just show you next to Excel. Okay, so they're pretty similar, right? They, they both look, look quite similar. They're columns of data, rows for the patients, instead of our variable names being the, on the top line in, in SPSS, our variables are now in this blue up the top of the column. So it's very familiar. It's not, this is not scary at all. Um, okay, so let's have a look at the data. So we're going to go analyze, descriptive statistics, frequencies, and we're going to select all the variables. So I just scroll down, hit shift, select, and then shift them into the variable box using this arrow. And I'm going to hit OK. So this is the output window. So every time I ask SPSS to do some, generate some kind of statistics, it chucks things into the output. So it's like a record of what, what things I have done and asked it to do. So we just bring that out. Okay, so frequencies is just tell me what's in every one of my variables. And so this first table here is just telling me what the variable names are in my data set. The valid means how many rows of data do I have present in my data set? So we move along and this says that there's 169 rows in this data set. And then we're moving along here and then it says there's 162. And here there's 168 and 159. So that's telling me that I have some missing data in my data set. And so I need to be aware of that because there might be implications down the track. So this is just something that I know. I've got missing data. I need to know about it. So our ID variable is, so every patient in your data sets will have a unique identifier. And it's really important that they have that unique identifier because sometimes we accidentally make typos. And so we might have an extra row of data that is a duplicate of one previously and for whatever reason it happens like all the time in my data sets. So I have to be really vigilant to make sure that we don't have extra rows of the same patient. And I use that ID variable to make that identification. So what I do here is this is we have um, patient IDs that are from one all the way through to 908 of their identifiers. And in this column here, I have values of one. So if I had duplicate data, this is the frequency. So how many times is the patient an ID of one represented in this data set? Only once and the same for all of the variables. So if I see a two or a three, I know that I've got duplicate data in there. Okay, so now we have this PP variable and it's coded zero and one. Group is one and two. So this is, remember I said that categorical variables can be numeric. Um, we've coded them numerically as per the data dictionary. And so I can see that there are like, I can see that it is numeric, but I have literally no idea what each one of these means. So I'm going to have to go and fix that. Um, I can't work like this because it doesn't make sense to me. I need to tell the software what those values are. So um, we're just having a look down here. So we've got about, so this is our frequency. We've got about 50% in each of our groups, which is what we'd expect. Um, we've got about 50% of men and women in our trial. Um, this variable here, so name of co-analgesia. So this is really interesting because there's like this blank here. I'm like, what is that? It's like no, there's nothing there. For 122 rows, there's nothing there. And that would be because up in the variable above, the co-analgesia, there's 122 patients that didn't receive analgesia. But this program doesn't know that this is missing. And so it's created a category of nothingness for 122. So I have to tell it that this is missing data for this 122. So then I'll have 47. So all of these will total up to 47. So we can also see that we have paracetamol and there's five 
a frequency of five for paracetamol. And then we have exactly the same in capital letters here for 36. So I know that those two things are exactly the same. And because someone's made a typo here and put it in different capitals and small letters, it's telling me that they're two separate things. So I'm going to have to fix that variable up. It's not, it can't be used in this form. So I need to collapse those two paracetamols into the same thing. So we've got a couple more variables that have numeric age ranging between 18 and 75, which is really important because we might have some inclusion or exclusion criteria that says that we can't, you know, it has to be people who are 18 or higher. So if I had some 17 or 16 year olds in here, I'd have to exclude them because they're not meant to be in my data set. Don't underestimate the time, the amount of data sets I've worked on where there are patients in them that there shouldn't be in there that have sneaked in. Um, so you really need to be vigilant of as you're going through this to match up with your inclusion exclusion criteria. Okay, so NRS, so for this particular study, we need an NRS of six or higher at admission to be able to be eligible for this trial. So this is really good. Everyone's got six or higher, so check. Um, and then we also know that an, a numeric rating scale for pain is between zero and 10. So these values here are all between zero and 10. So excellent, that's good. Okay, um, we see down here that we have some missing data. So I have seven data points that are missing for my T30. So I need to be aware of that. Um, there's no missing data for my baseline. And this is interesting too, so my change in NRS, I have full data for everyone, except that I just said before that my T30 has missing data. So there's something wrong that I need to fix in that too. Um, okay, so heart rate, we've got someone with 48 and goes all the way up to 120. We've got some missing data there and our respiratory rate variable. There's nothing unusual in here. Um, we also have some missing data. Okay, so now let's make, let's pretty up SPSS and get some, um, add some details to it so that we know what we're doing. Okay, so, on this front screen for SPSS, we have this tab down the bottom called variable view. So it's basically a data dictionary view, just a little bit different. Okay, so it has um, our variable names down here. Um, it tells us what type our variables are. So here we have numeric variables and we have string variables. So numeric variables can be like, you know, like weight or height, um, or they could be the numeric coding we did for our continuous, um, for our categorical variable. Um, they could also be an ordinal scale. So we have string variables, which is our, so gender we, or sex, we did male and female, so it's just words, so it's definitely a string. Um, so we just need to be aware of this, of our variable type, because sometimes the statistics that you're doing won't allow you to do them because the variable type is wrong. And it's also, so for instance, sometimes our numeric variable, there's a space or someone's put a letter or something afterwards, and it's called it a string and it won't let you do any analyses because it's wrong. <laughs> so this is like a, oh, that should be numeric. I need to go find out what on earth's wrong with that one. Um, so this thing over on measures, so it's also um, something similar to type. So here we, we can see that um, we have scale and we have nominal variables. So scale means it's a continuous variable. Um, so like age and weight, nominal means that it's, it fits into a category. And the third version that we have here is ordinal. So NRS is actually ordinal. So it's a scale between zero and um, 10, so we're just going to change it to ordinal. Um, so it's not a nominal, it's not, it doesn't have, it has an order. Okay. So that's looking pretty good to me. Okay, let's chuck some value labels on this. So PP is the per protocol population is data set and we have values of one for yes and no is zero. So I need to tell, tell SPSS that. So I'm going to put in here a one is a yes and a um, zero is no. 
Okay, and because I am i don't want to retype that, I can cheat and just go copy. And I also know coanalgesia is also zeros and ones. Oops, it's not going to work. Change. Okay, see if it'll copy this time. The tension. It's going to take a while. It might not come back. Okay, let's just open up another version. Okay, and start again. Okay, so this one here was zero is no. Oh, add one is yes. No. Okay, this is the same. Zero. No. One. Yes. So it's really tedious and you just have to keep going and be patient. Zero, no. Nausea is the same. And, okay, dictionary again. Okay, so our randomization group is morphine is one, so I need to tell it that morphine is one. So one is morphine, two is sufentanil. Uh, what else have we got here? No, all good. Okay, um, because I might not like to use my variable names, um, I might like to have full descriptions of what they are. I can also copy these over. So um, I could just use the copy, the details, and enter zero and paste. So now when I look at my variable, it'll tell me what that is instead of using this code. So you might prefer to do it this way. I um, I personally don't because it's kind of, sometimes the labels, the, the words get too long and it cuts it off and you like, what is that? Um, so anyway, so it's completely up to you. Lots of people like adding the labels so that they're, it's, they're very clear about what they have. So you can copy and paste the same, and normally you can copy and paste your value labels. Okay, so coanalgesia. So that one had missing data. So I need to tell it, I'll just change this one over to uh, ordinal again um, here. Our co-analgesia we had missing. So that's on row six. 
And here is our missing column. So this is where we define missing in our data set. So this happens a lot because remember I said lots of people have these 999 values and things that they insert into their database to say that they're missing. So in the missing variable here, we click on, sorry, click on this little dot, 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 and it's a discrete and it's just a space in categorical variables. So you just put a space in it and hit OK, and then all those 122 that were missing are now made missing. We've told it that those are missing values. So that's that's good. OK, uh, now we have this coanalgesia is a, a name of coanalgesia and there was all those paracetamols that were a bit kind of messy. So let's fix those up. So we would um, bring this down here and I'm going to go and sort the variables so I can see them. And I'm just going to adjust it in, in SPSS. So you don't have to bring it back into Excel. You can just make it changes in SPSS as well. So I'm going to sort my cases, sort by the name of the co-analgesia. OK. And whoop, just close that one. OK, so this is that variable, the name of coanalgesia, and I just want to change all those small paracetamols. So I'm just going to copy this here and I'm just going to paste it. So I, it, now it's going to be all the same. And again, you should be able to select and paste a whole lot of them at the same time, but just in case it installs again, we'll just take the long route. OK, the other thing is that we had those NRSs of 30 and they're all like, like what's going on with that. So we better fix that up and have a quick look. So um, in here is our SPSS data set and we have change in NRS. So um, we're going to just use the filter function. So data, filter, uh, NRS 30, we have all these blanks. So uh, here is my blanks and I've unselected everything else. And here we can see that Excel doesn't know that it's missing, it's made it a zero. And so it's just made up number and it's like zero minus seven minus seven. So it's made an error here and they're not real. Um, and so we need to be aware of that because Excel does make mistakes. So in here, I need to go up to our NRS 30. And again, I'm just gonna sort my data. Uh, where are we? Data, sort cases. OK. And we'll scroll right up to the top again. And these are our missing and these are all invalid. So we're just going to delete them. OK, so our data set's ready to go. Um, so now we are going to run our frequencies again with the real data all set up and looking pretty for us. So. Analyze frequencies. I only want to look at some uh, categorical data this time. So here's our categorical data. OK, so morphine. Now we can see we have 86 people in the morphine group. 50.9% had morphine um, male and female. We have 50%. About 27.8% had coanalgesia. This is all fixed now. We now have 41 in here and we have 122 missing, which matches with our 122 that didn't have coanalgesia up here. We have all our no's and yeses. So everything's looking great. We have these low, very low numbers with, with these two variables, these adverse outcomes. So we need to make note of that because we have some tests that we're going to use that they don't like low numbers. So um, we need to be aware of that. OK, so let's have a look at our categorical variables. OK, so I know whether you guys remember what normal distribution looks like. So we have this bell-shaped curve for a normal distribution, which I'll show you how you actually make it look like that in your data in a moment. Um, and so normally distributed data has this assumption that when we're comparing groups, that the groups themselves have a um, similar standard deviations between them. So, um, so you see um, on 
On my far left, we have um, our data is kind of clumped and they're in similar slices, whereas our non normally distributed data here, we have this bimodal thing happening, we have skewed data, and the final plot we have is that we have lots of variability in our last two groups. So that's all features of not, norm, not normal data. Okay. Okay, so here is our SPSS data set. We're going to have a look at that um, continuous data. So we look at frequencies again. This time we're going to spit out some statistics. So here are all of our variables that we're going to look at. So we're not going to have a look at these numerics, numeric rating scales to zero and one in just in this example. We just look at the variables of interest to us that we're going to report in our tables. So instead of doing frequencies, I'm going to turn that off and I'm going to run the statistics here. So I click statistics, mean, median, I want quarter, standard deviation, min, max, skewness, ketosis, and OK. Okay, so here is the top of the frequency table that we saw before. So this time we've got a whole lot of statistics in here. So I'm looking at this and first thing I'm looking at is my valid number. So change in NRS, I've got missing data in all of these three variables. Um, so my mean and medians are pretty similar. So that's a feature of normally distributed data is our mean and medians will be quite similar. And we move across and they're all quite similar in this instance. Our standard deviation is smaller than our mean, so that's a good thing. Um, that means that there, you know, there is some variability. There's different amounts of variability depending on what variable we're looking at. So skewness tells us how symmetrical is our data? Is it skewed? Um, so a value of below minus one or above one means that we have skewed data. So, um, and here we can read across and this respiratory rate variable is greater than one. So that's a flag. It's not normally distributed. Um, so ketosis, it is a measure of the shape of our data. So if the value is over three, it's like the shape of it, it's quite flat and it's got some outliers happening somewhere that's changing the distribution. Um, so here we see 4.2. So respiratory rate is not normally distributed. All these other variables are normally distributed. Um, again, this is a nice time to just check your min max values fit within the ranges. Okay. Okay, let's have a look at some of that data as a plot. So this is a histogram feature. So um, let's have a look at our change in NRS. Let's chuck on a normal curve onto it. Okay, see, histogram, this is our change in NRS. And as you can see, we have this beautiful bell-shaped curve. So the data is normally distributed. So let's have a look now at our respiratory rate and see what that looks like. Um, so respiratory rate is here. And I know to you guys, you go, oh, gosh, Emma, that's not overly different, but it kind of is because we have some outliers up here and this side is not quite as symmetrical as it is to this side. So um, this one is not normally distributed. And finally, let's have a look at age. So age here. Like, what is that, right? Like, it looks like a mess. So what happens is that um, with histograms, the statistical software chucks age into bins. So bins might be a few years, like three years or five years or something, and the bin size for our data is not working. That's why we have something that looks like this. So when you're plotting your data, you can change the bin size if you want, or you can know that I've run the statistics, I've had a look at them, my mean, my mean and median are similar, I know that I don't have any skewness or kurtosis, I'm not seeing these bimodal like two peaks in this data, like it doesn't look pretty, but I haven't got anything that looks like really weird. So you, this data is normally distributed, it just doesn't look like it is. Okay. Um, 
so we had all that missing data. So the next thing we need to do is, so with this RCT, we have um, to we have per protocol. So per protocol is those patients that went through and completed the start the study, and we have data for. So I need to select for them, and this is not unusual in data sets. Like so, you know, remember when I said we have these duplicate patients sometimes in our data set. So we just have something that's like, you know, it's just complete outlier, like there's something wrong with this data, it shouldn't be there, we need to exclude them. So we have to tell the software to exclude them. You could just delete them in your file or we can choose to exclude them. I like to keep them in my data set. I like to be able to see all the changes that have happened over time. So I need to select that. So it's data select uh, if per protocol is equal to one, and so this is going to give me the right data set. And the reason I know this is it has crossed out all of my zeros. So per protocol, zero is here. You can see this line crossing it out. And I only have values of one. And so I just check how many we have there. Group. Oh, that's not going to tell me anything. Let's turn the frequencies on. So here I now only have 136 patients in my data set. Okay. Um, okay, one last check. Let's just have a look at our data distribution just to see where we're going to go um, with our outcome variables. So we're going to do a box plot. We're going to do clustered, sum by the separate variables. I'm going to chuck the numeric pain rating at 0 and 30 in here by group. I just want to have a look at where we're heading. I want to see, understand what's happening with this change. Okay, here we go. So this is a box plot. So box plots are the top, bottom here is the 25th percentile, top is the 75th percentile of your data. Um, the, these numbers up here are outliers, so they're more than 1.5. Um, they're yeah, more than 1.5 from the median, um, and they signify that they're, they're outliers that don't fit with the rest of the data. So as you can see, we have from our zero admission, how pain has dropped over 30 for both of our treatment groups, which is awesome. Um, and we can also see that there's quite a bit of variability. So the boxes are different sizes. So it's always good to have a visual play around with your data just to see where you're heading. Um, it's really helpful. Okay, if you get stuck, SPSS has some help menus available for you. Um, and it's just in this topics field here. Um, I won't click on it because it needs to go to the web. Um, and oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> um, and so it's really helpful. It has case studies and tutorials, and I'll step you through all the kinds of things that I'm doing now and take you through all the, all the menu options. So it's a very valuable resource to be aware of. Okay, so I know that that feels like, oh my God, when are we actually getting to this? But you need to do all those steps to get to this next bit. And that was the hardest bit done in this process is getting our data set up and ready for the analysis. So, um, yeah, so you could just go through these um, menus to have a look at, your, at how to do it in SPSS with the help menu. Okay, so is there any questions so far? There is one. Someone's just asked if you could please show them the list of other menu selections, but I think you just answered the question then, so. Yeah, um, and th sorry, the menu at the end of my SPSS presentation, I've actually got all of the steps for you um, and you can take a picture or or you can just go have a look at the presentation. So it's all there. Yeah. When you change the labeling before the corrected paracetamol, will it keep a log of all the data corrections? No, SPSS doesn't keep a log. Yeah, so um, what I actually do is I create a copy of my variable and then I and then I make changes to the copy. So because I like to keep in a copy of the original. But in this case, it's only changing it from small to big. So it's like, it's all good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All good. Okay, I have a sip of water. Here we go. 
Okay, so. So we just went through which statistics, so what was our data, what did it look like? We found out that respiratory rate was not normally distributed. So it's going to be reported as a median interportal range and everything else is going to be reported as a median and standard deviation. So this was the empty table that we, we had originally and now I've updated it. So I've got means and standard deviations for each of my variables up in the top of my column. I now know I've got 136 patients in my data set. So I'm going to add that up and I'm going to write how many patients in each of my groups. So this is really important because people need to know how many people are in your group, so whether they can trust your data, because if you've got three people in one group, they're probably going to go, this <laughs> is not great. Um, so beside the variable, so in my columns, I have mean and standard deviation at the top, but when I change the statistic to something else, that's not that, I need to put it beside the variable. So I've got that um, the median interquartile range beside it. I've also got my units, so weights in kilograms, um, and I've got my categorical variables with my N and percent beside them. And now for my change in NRS, I've decided I don't want mean. I actually want to report mean difference and I want a 95% confidence interval. Um, so I've added that to my change in NRS. So before I start any stats, I need to return back to my research question. I just need to remind myself so I keep on track. Okay, so we're going to assess analgesia provided by sufentanil compared to morphine in acute trauma patients using the NRS. Um, we're going to compare the two treatments and my primary outcome is change in NRS. Okay. Okay, so we have, this is the univer univariate flowchart for statistical tests. So we're only sticking at the univariate level um, and in this case, so this is so before we just ran statistics for our variables overall. So now we're going to look for some relationships between our variables. So um, we might be looking for a difference or we might look, be looking at a correlation here. And then our data, it could be paired data or it could be independent data. So um, this is really important that our, so we had this NRS at zero and at 30 minutes and that's paired data because we've make it, taken a measurement on our patient twice. So that, that is paired data, it needs to be treated specially, but we're not really interested in using those two variables separately. We've got a change in NRS and that is just a single number that's from the difference between the two scores. So that's actually independent data. So you need to be very aware of whether you have paired or independent data. So we have independent data. We um, have our continuous variables. We have ordinal, we have nominal, and they each, you can use this to kind of like flow through. So we have um, normal and we have non-normal data. And then it comes down to, well, how many groups do I want to compare? Because the test, that's very much dependent on what test I'm going to use. So, um, and then we have a number of tests. So there's not like this ridiculous, there is a lot of statistical tests to choose from. Don't get me wrong, statisticians like, like lots of options, but these are the tried and true robust methods that you will need to use in, in your studies. And if you follow these, you'll be fine. Okay. So statistical analysis plan, it's part of your protocol that you originally um, did up for ethics. So it's usually like a paragraph for a statistical analysis plan. Um, so for here, we have patient characteristics. We're not going to report our p-values, but we're still going to do the test. So we uh, have categorical variables. So this was whether they had the co-analgesia or whether we had, um, we had sex and we're going to use a chi-squared test or Fisher's exact test. I don't know which one yet. So we go um, difference, independent, it's nominal variable rather than continuous variable, and it's one of these two options here. Okay, we have um, our outcome variable is change in our NRS. We're going to use a student t-test, and I can do that because it's independent data. So, and it's normally distributed. And my secondary outcomes, they're categorical, so there was hypertension there. So again, it's the chi-squared test, all the Fisher's exact test. And in this instance, we're going to say that a p-value less than 0.05 is going to be significant. Okay, so student t-test. So let's have a look at this. So 
all statistical tests. So remember back to science in high school and we had these hypotheses that we were making. So all statistical tests have a hypothesis. So we have a null hypothesis and we have an alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis for a student t-test is that the mean of each group is equal and the alternative is that those two means are different. So um, what we're going to be doing is so that we're using our mean is the change, the mean change in pain for each of this in this particular uh, example. And so all our statistical tests have, they create a statistic. So um, we have a T statistic for um, a student T test. And so what we're going to do is put our data into calculate what this statistic is, and then we're going to compare it to a T distribution. And when we do that, we're going to, that will determine the probability of how unlikely our null hypothesis is to be true. So this method has some assumptions to it. So it's a parametric method um, so that our data needs to be uh, quantitative and needs to be plausibly normal. So it doesn't need to be perfect. This test, this method is pretty robust to um, things that are a bit deviating from normality. Uh, our observations have to be independent. We have um, two, we have to have so this is where we, I was talking about this, this, the two groups, the variability within the groups needs to be similar. So that's also an assumption of this test. So there's this on BMJ is got really great resources, um, actually has like lots of like it's got some lots of statistical, like really basic statistical resources, but it's also got how to read a paper and how to write a paper resources, which are really, really useful. So well worth having a look at. Okay, so the Pearson chi-squared test, the null hypothesis is that there's no association between the variables. The alternative hypothesis is that there is an association and it has a test statistic that takes into account the observed frequency and the expected frequency. And it calculates statistic and compares it to a chi-squared distribution. So as you're seeing, there's very there's a lot of similarities in these um, tests that we're doing. So this one, the variables have to be categorical. They have to be, the observations have to be independent and this expected value of cells needs to be five or more in 80, at least 80% of the cells. So every test that you use is going to have assumptions related to it. It's going to have a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. And you need to be, you need to have an awareness of this. So there's lots of excellent resources, SPSS, there's this lead statistics websites. They run through um, how to do a lot of, um, the steps through this process. Okay, let's go back to our data set. Okay, so we have selected the right data, we've excluded, um, done our exclusions, and now we're going to run our test. So using this analyze, um, Menu again, so analyze, descriptive statistics, cross tabs. Now group is the thing I want to compare, so I'm going to chuck it into my columns and here are my categorical variables here. So I'm going to select them all, chuck them into rows because I want to do it all at once. I don't have the patience to sit there and do it one at a time. Um, I want to get it to give me some chi-squared tests. I want it to give me some column percentages. Hit OK. OK. So go back up to here. OK, so the pieces that I need to know of this. So in that original table that I did, I was going to report males. So the, the values that I'm interested in reporting is this is my, seven, my overall and then my two groups. So let's just make that happen. Okay, so in here I literally go 71, 52.2%, morphine is 40, 58.0%, 31. 
0.38%. It's painful. There is no easy way to do this. Um, I have to type out each and every number and you have to do it like you do it this way and then just before you finish it, you have to go rerun it and tick each one off. So it's a very tedious process. Okay, so we now have reported, so we're filling out our tables. So for sex, we're reporting males. We have an overall morphine, sofentanil, and now we enter our p-value. So we have here a... Um, so remember I said it had that funny expected value thing. So if this value here is, is an assumption, if this is 20 or more, then I have to report a fish is exact. Um, and if it's less than that, I can report a Pearson. So we might just make this a bit bigger. Um, okay, so the p-values that I'm interested in is this two-sided asymptotic p-value. So there's like, these are all p-values. You've got like lots to choose from. This is the only one you need for a Pearson chi-squared and this is the only one you need for a Fisher's exact. So I'm seeing that I have zero cells with an expected count of less than five. SPSS is beautiful because it tells you you don't have to ask for it, whereas a lot of other programs you actually have to ask for the expected values and you need to manually do calculations. So SPSS is great for that. And the p-value is 0.72, so I enter that in. So, and we just keep going through and co-analgesia used during procedure, we do the yes variable. And so we entered this into our total and this is our um, morphine and sofentanil. So this is, there's 33% of patients in the morphine group who have received co-analgesia during their procedure. Um, we just go and we fill out each of these tables. For here, we have 0% again. So we do the Pearson chi-squared p-value of this one. Uh, we're not going to report our co-analgesia group hypertension. We've got these tiny percentages. So we have one person who had hypertension at 4.1.4%, um, and same for sofentanil, something very similar. So this is the row that we would report into here. Um, in, but this time, I don't really want the total. I just want to do the comparison of the groups. Um, but this time, we have a p-value. Sorry, our... our um, we have 50% of the expected count less than five. So this is where I would report Fisher's exact. So I read along the Fisher's exact and I'm going to do a two-sided p-value for here. So that's a report of one. So I'm going to report 1.000, which Excel will just change to one. Oh no, not in this case. Okay, normally it just changes it to one. Um, and we just kind of like work through entering all of these values. Um, this one here for, um, it's going to have a Fisher's exact again. So the p-value is going to be 0 0.241. And um, in nausea, we have a lot higher percentages. Um, so again, our expected count is zero. So we're going to go for a Pearson chi-squared test and report this p-value. And so that, that um, while we hear this, that test statistic that I was talking about, this is the test statistic it calculated is 1.240 is the test statistic that it's going to compare to the chi-squared distribution. And it doesn't, turns out it's not, there's a low probability that it's, um, that the null hypothesis is, is unlikely. So um, we are now going to have a look at our continuous data. Okay, so we're comparing means. We're doing a student t-test. So independent t-test. So age, weight, change, a heart rate. We chuck it into our test variables. Our group is going into our group variable. Now, back in the um, data dictionary, we had one was, uh, was it morphine and two was uh, sofentanil. So I need to tell it that I want very, like it's the coding. So it's one and two um, is the two groups that I want to compare with this method. I hit okay. Okay. Okay, so it's giving me, again, the numbers that I'm going to use to plug into here. So um, i just bring that over a little bit. So for age, I have my morphine, I have 69, I have 42, amine of 42, standard deviation of 16. And here uh, for sofentanil, I have 43 is my mean and a 15, uh, sorry, a 16 is my standard deviation. 
So you literally just go, whoop, you literally just go and enter the numbers from this top table, which is the descriptive statistics essentially for each group. Okay, let's have a look at the T test itself. Okay, so for age, I have, so one of the assumptions for the t student T test was that we had to have equal variances. So it does this thing called the Levine's test to test whether my variances are equal between the two, the morphine and surfentanil group. So it says no, I've got a p-value of 0.755 by this significant. So that means that I can report this p-value over here, which is on this line of equal variances assumed. So here's my p-value. If this number here was significant, I can't assume that my variances are equal. And so therefore I would report this p-value here. So in this case, because they are equal, it gives the same number. So this is the p-value that I enter in my table. And all of these are not significant for Levine's test. So I'm going to report this line of equal variances assumed in each case. So um, er there's nothing significant except for my change in NRS, which has come up as 0.003. So while we're here, it's also uh, good to see that it calculates what my mean difference is between my groups. So there's a mean difference of 1.1 on the numeric grading scale between for the change in NRS. And here is my 95% confidence interval that it's spat out for me of uh, 0.3. 3.9 and 1.42, I mean 8.2. So that I need these numbers to put in my table because this comes into my final conclusion. Okay, so one thing, so I work through and I fill out all of these numbers into these tables. Um, and, but one thing that the this change in up here, it only gives me a mean and a standard deviation. I don't want mean and standard deviation. I want the mean difference and the 95% confidence interval. So this is not giving me what I want. I have to get it to spit it out. So um, I have to ask for it. So we're going to go analyze, descriptive statistics, explore. And then we're going to go down here to change in NRS, um, yeah, change in NRS into this, into the dependent list and group into our factor list. I just want it to spit out statistics for me. So here we go. This is where we get our 95% confidence interval from. So this is the mean value that we had up here. So 4.09 and 5.19, our mean value and our 95% confidence interval. So SPSS doesn't give it to you in the form that you want necessarily. If you want a confidence interval, you have to go find it. Um, so it, it's under the explore command. Um, so this is where I get these numbers from. Okay, so we now want to do our respiratory rate, which is our um, not normally distributed data. So I need to, I want to collect the numbers to fill out my table. So I'm going to report median interquartile range. I, I, it's not easy to get an SPSS either, so I need to ask for it. So I need to split my file. So data, split file. I'm going to split it by compare groups kick my group over here, hit OK. So now it's going to separate them into two different things. And I'm going to use this frequency command again to ask for respiratory rate. And I just want my median and interquartile range. I don't want all these other statistics this time. So I use the frequency command a lot. So median, quartiles, OK. OK, so for morphine group, I have a median of 16, 25th percentile of 15 and 18, and these are the values that I'm going to enter into this table here. So respiratory rate here, 16, 15, 15 and I just round up to, it was 18.75, and I just want to round it up to 19. And keep going, you keep entering the values. So we've now got, if I'd entered it all in, I'd have all my group statistics, but I don't have the overall statistics for any of this. Um, and I only actually want it for the patient characteristics. So I'm going to have to go back and ask for those. So we go analyze. So we've got to turn off our split. If you uh, don't turn off, you will keep having your data split in the analysis. So let's turn that off. Analyze all cases. Um, we're going to descriptive statistics, frequencies. 
age, weight, and heart rate. We want overall numbers. I don't want it to run all the frequency tables. I just want the statistics for the overall, so I can fill out the overall column. And we know that it, we're reporting mean and standard deviation. So mean, standard deviation, everything else is off. Continue, okay. So these are the values here that I'm going to be plugging into this overall column. So age, we have 42 is the mean age and 16 is our standard deviation. Okay. To get our p-value for respiratory rate, I missed that. Okay, we're going to go analyze non-parametric tests, independent samples, just click on this fields tab, shift my respiratory rate variable over into the test field, group variable into group, and I'm just gonna hit run. Like just don't fiddle with the other settings. There's not much to it. It can, it'll work it out. Okay, so here it's using a man Whitney U test. So the it broke the assumptions of the the uh, for the student T test by being not normally distributed. So we use a man Whitney U test for this one. It's chosen the right 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 test, and this is the p value we're going to report of 0 0.170. And so that will just go into this one here. So respiratory rate. Okay, so you just got to work through it slowly one at a time. Okay, complete table. <laughs> so you don't have to watch me enter them. <laughs> okay, so that's it. We finished the analysis. We've filled out our table. We've got all the statistics that we've got. So um, that's it. Um, we are going to now look at how do I interpret these values? What's really of interest to me? Um, so, so the reason why I've reported to a whole number for age and weight is because back when we did the, um, if you have a look at back at the data set, oh, we still got our filter on. Okay, so it's collected as whole numbers. So I'm reporting it as a whole number because it's collected as a whole number. Whereas if I had age with like a fraction with the months in it, I would re report it with one decimal place. But in this particular case, whole number, report in whole number. Okay, so um, percentages, I like to report to one decimal place for percentages. So I have my frequency of N value, so I have 71 males, um, and that makes up 52.2% of my population. My average age here is 16. I mean, is 42 with a standard deviation of 16. So it's really important to report our standard deviation um, with our mean values because that informs the reader about how much variability there is in the sample, and so they can get a better feel for your data. So just saying that I, you know, the average age of 42 is not terribly useful if you don't have the other piece of information. Okay, so my question for these percentages is that I have uh, a male. So we have 58% of our sample who, patients who had morphine are male, and there's 46 in here. So the thing I'm comparing with the categorical variables is this percent compared to this percent. So the p-value says it's not significant. So, but I'm looking at that going 50, 40, 58, 46, like that's kind of a bit of a difference. Um, but statistically, it's not. So you can choose to go and just report the overall if you'd like. So you'd say that 52.2% uh, of my sample were male um, and that with an average age of 42 with a standard deviation of 16. So this is what you would write up in your um, discussion. If you think that this difference is important, um, clinically important that they, we've got these difference. Um, this is what we call, you know, the size of the effect. So we have a difference um, in percentage here, and, and we might like to drill down to that level and ignore our p-values altogether if that's what you'd prefer. But it's more than fine to go. It's not significant, and I have 52.2% male. Okay, so with our um, continuous variables, so weight, we're comparing these two. So 73, a mean of 73 versus a mean of, 
of 70. That's not significantly different between groups. Um, and so we can report that the average weight of our patients is 72 with a standard deviation of 15. For our respiratory rate, it's different with recording median values. So we're going to be comparing 16 to 18. So it's not, not, big, not a big difference. If that's clinically significant difference, then you're going to be reporting it. But it's, I don't know that it is clinically significant. So I can just, you know, if I want to report respiratory rate admission, I can say that the median respiratory rate admission is 17. Um, for co-analgesia, we don't have a difference between groups. So I can just say that 27.9% that of, of my patients received co-analgesia during the procedure. Okay, so with p-values, if our value is less than zero, is greater than 0 0.1, greater than or equal to 0 0.1, we're going to report to two decimal places. It doesn't, we don't really need to know about three. It's kind of like extra information if you like typing extra numbers. Um, and p values of less than 0 0.1 we report to three decimal places. So in hospital research, we don't need like eight decimal places. Like if you're doing a genomics type project, then that's when they report lots more decimal places. But for hospital work, two for for less than, I mean, greater than or equal to 0.1 p-value and three decimal places for less than 0.1. And SPSS, if it's highly um, significant, it's going to give you a, a p-value of 0, 0.000. And what it mean, wants you to do is report your p-value is less than 0, 0.001. Okay. Um, for here, our respiratory rate of less than 10 per minute variable, we have zero in our morphine group. And rather than just ignore, like put a value of zero, just because it looks pretty and visually, it's an easier read if everything looks exactly the same. So if we just say 0, 0.0, 0 and 0%, 0 it looks, it's a visually, it's an easy read because everything looks the same. So we just add that detail in rather than just putting a value of zero or nothing or something. Um, okay, a p-value of one is real, like they're, they're the same. <laughs> um, you know, both of them have 1.4, 1.5, that's not different. Um, this is a real number um, and so we have no evidence that the, the null hypothesis isn't true. So um, we report to, we report it as 1.00. Okay, so at this point, we're just going to know that we, we know that there's a difference in NRS between our two groups. Okay, so we're at, getting close to the end. So our primary outcome variable, now we're going to enter all our data. So uh, our mean difference in NRS at first administration and NRS at 30 minutes is minus 4.1 for the morphine group and um, minus 5.2 for the sephentanol group. And this is a mean difference of 1.1. So at the end of all this work, this is it. Like this is the sentence that pulls it all together and answers your research question. So um, it's a lot of hard work to get one sentence, <laughs> but that's okay. It's a really important sentence. <laughs> okay, so uh, in summary, what we're going to do, get you to do is you write down your research question, keep reminding yourself because you will get distracted along the way in your research journey. Um, always remember what your original study design is because study design will dictate what methods that you need to use. Um, always remember what your primary outcome is because you'll always have one primary outcome and then you'll have some secondary outcomes um, in these projects. Um, know what your variables are. I know you think, like you say, I collected them, I know what they are, but you need to really truly understand what they are. Like, you know, make sure you've got weight is all reported in kilograms and not a mixture of kilograms and grams, or those kind of things. Like really have an awareness of what, what it is that you've got. Do up your empty tables, because you're just gonna, then it's just a process of filling them out. Like you know what you're doing, you stay on task, it's not a problem. Um, cleaning and preparing your data site set takes an enormous amount of time. It can take me a couple of days to clean a data set and prepare it for analysis. Don't underestimate that 
how you put in all this effort to collect your data and it still needs a lot of work to get your variables into a form that's analyzable. Um, understand your data, update your statistics in your empty tables so that you won't get, you go, oh, what was that variable? Which, which was I supposed to do, mean, median? Like, you know, we, we changed it so that they were all recording means and the median for respiratory rate. So then you run your analysis and you fill out your tables and interpret and that's the process. <laughs> so that's it. We're done. Um, and at the end of here, I also have SPSS menu. So this is click here, 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 and here. So um, we have for bringing the file into SPSS, frequencies, figures with stats, sorting your variables, selecting data. Sorry, you want me to go back to that original one? Yep. Sorry, are these slides available? Yes. Yeah, yeah they will. Yeah. So, um, and how to run the chi squared test and then Whitney test. Like I said, there's lots of different options, like things that you can select. I don't, you don't really need to understand what each of the boxes you tick and select are. If you just follow this set of instructions, you will analyze it appropriately. <laughs> so there's lots of features. There's lots of ways of doing things in SPSS, like you can get it to do statistical tests using many different options. Um, and same with, with the descriptive statistics. So what I'm hoping to show you guys is if you follow this process, you won't get lost in the numbers because you can click away and generate anything you like. Um, but if you've got a process to follow, you're not going to generate a whole lot of numbers and become overwhelmed with which one am I actually going to present um, and getting confused. Like it's, it's not a confusing process if you know what the process is and how to think through it. And yeah, the last ones on how to do um, plotting your data. Okay. Is there any questions online? No, there's lots of thank yous. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. What's the arrangement Metro North got in relation to accessing the actual software itself? Like, um, is it available for employees or is it available for the triple employees? Is it just like through the Metro North online commissioning? Yep. Um, and so they are like a Skype's access. Um, so you've got like a, a, a broader license that you can run into. Oh, of course. Oh, is that on the software center? Yeah, so you just download? But no, you can just actually um, request a phone roll through the I just did it and mm. it was quite, you, know, you couldn't actually choose it, so I did the chat thing. Yeah. Up, I just chatted. Yeah. Done. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The chat, it was done in a quick process. Just, just, just go. Just do the chat. Yeah. <laughs> I do that for everything with IT. Yes. This year, I just go straight to the chat. They go, here's the link. Thanks. The main thing you can do Oh, and I oh, know a few people are asking for the slides. So the recording of the slides will be made available mm -hmm. after the session. Yeah, and I'll also yeah put up the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and can you do a similar run through for regression analysis? We are actually doing, we do the statistics unit runs. We have advertised on the Metro North events page and they actually do a lot of this in our, our workshops because lots of people like to use R. Um, and we, so we'll have workshops running next year in doing exactly what I've done, but in R. And they also do the regression, like linear regression and, you know, um, survival analysis and logistic regression in R as well. So there are opportunities to learn. That's it. Yeah. Um, when you went through the tables of the results to say, okay, you need to look at this value to know which one of these you report, it, are the help, top, the help topics is that the best way to go when you've got the output to go, uh, what does this mean, what should I report? Um, I, I don't know, I haven't looked mm -hmm. at the help topics to do that. I would be 
I would imagine there's very mixed opinions. So statisticians like to have very strong opinions on what they works for them as an individual rather than what um, works for everybody. So um, I think the, the values that I've shown you are the standard process that I use. Um, if you read into the literature too heavily, you'll find that some people go, no, you must report a one-sided exact, you can't read, like, you know, some people like, you know, must be this, a p-value over here rather than this one. So it gets really confusing if you start to dig die, deep dive. So that's why I've said this is the p-value if this is less than, um, is less than 20 and this one over here is the p-value for more than 20. Um, and you might see um, the lid, statistics website it might have some data it might it is more likely to to pick the correct ones for you they step through examples for you and run the test and then do some interpretation so yeah susan's asked what about regression in sbss as r is another step up it is we haven't got any plans as of yet so but i think hopefully we'll have a put a document up on to our um the QMR external website, the statistics unit has a resources uh, page and contacts page, and they um, there'll be there will soon be guides in there for how to do this kind of stuff in you know um, all the packages SPSS and SAS and Stata and R, uh, and it's, it's like a step by step guide of all the basic um, tests. So it's really easy to run tests. It's harder to get your data right and to interpret them and make sure that they're, they're, they're correct. But if you're following the procedures that we show you and how to run the test, you're not going to make the mistakes because you've run the test incorrectly. It's more to do with have you got the right data to start with. So anyway, those documents will be available and so the regression analyses will be up on one of those. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, this is, um, I guess, a bit of a logistics kind of question. But I've got, um, so let's say one participant with multiple time points, mm -hmm. and then I'm looking at something like, I don't know, like peripheral, like PT time, and then something at each of those time points, so let's say they were PT, and then something else that's not related to coagulation, like a, I'd say the temperature. Is it better to have the entire data set in one SPSS file, or would I make two? No. And one with all the PTs and then a separate file with the temperature. I'm not going to do any analysis with those two. Yeah, you, you want to keep all your data together in one data yeah. set. So uh, again, on the statistics website, there's a uh, um, document on preparing your data. Um, and because you have longitudinal data, it needs to be in a different format. So for this data set, we had a patient. Each patient was on a single row. So for longitudinal, which is over time, you flip it. And so that it, you, each patient has multiple rows rows with different time points. So that's how you put the data together to actually run the analysis. But a lot of people, they, you know, like they'll say time, they, their data set will be set up like this one and will have time point one, time point two, time point three across. And that's not typically how you do the analysis when you have multiple time points, but it's really helpful for you guys to be able to use Excel and go, what's the difference between here and here yeah. to look at. So anyway, the yeah, you do keep all your data together. Like Excel files, when I receive an Excel file from my client and there's like 10 spreadsheets that I'm 10 tabs and I need to create it into one, um, I don't really want that. I really just want one spreadsheet. So um, have a look at that document and it'll tell you how to prepare your data appropriately. So on the QIMR Berhofer, um, there's if you just Google QIMR Berhofer Statistics Unit, that it'll come up for our web page. Thank you very much. No problem. Just um, used to using Starter Sets, it's more just the visual interface question. That log file that's currently showing up the left, mm -hmm. if I use the same labels in say the second data set and I apply the analysis you've just done to say data set A to a fresh data set and it will retain what you so what you actually want is to write syntax. Oh, yeah. So it's yeah, so you, you wanna so this I just showed you the drop down menu yeah. drive of SPSS. There is a um in here we have oh we might be able to actually find something at the top of one of these. 
So see up here, there's this wow. code up here. So um, and at the end of each each program, so when we did cross tabs, there was this pace function. And so that is the code to rerun the same analysis. So you like select it and hit the go arrow, the red, I mean, sorry, the the green arrow to get it to run. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the code yeah. at the top of each one as well. So sure. there's two ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. Some people like it's, it's beautiful for when you want to rerun it and you don't want to think through the process, you just want to rerun it. And I always do it when I do issue a report. So it's a log of, well, what, what were the final things that went into my analysis? So I keep a copy of that. And I use a mixture of writing code and and using the um, menus. It's not a, I'm not precious about writing code. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much, everyone.